Good, thanks. Thanks, Don. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's great. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I need that. I actually get, uh, I speak several times a week and I get nervous every time. So if I don't have some energy from the audience, I, uh, I'm going to forget what I'm going to say. Um, man, I'm in love with life. Uh, this is such a fantastic, fantastic community. I may not leave. Uh, so, uh, You're right uh, with the last job. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, settle for that, but settle for uh, any other place in this great, uh, in this great community. And we hear that word community a lot uh, these days. And as Don was saying, it's central to us at RBC. Our, our mission is to help, it's, we call it our purpose, but it's to help uh, clients thrive and communities prosper. And the communities prosper side of it is really important to us. You may ask, like, what does a mega billion dollar corporation care about communities. But we know that our business, our foundation, is our clients and our communities. We also know our country, Canada, Joe Clark once called it the community of communities. <coughs> We've got provinces, with all due respect to the minister of the province. Um, but we're really a nation of communities. We're a community of communities. And that's what makes Canada wonderful. So what's a community? It's a place, but it's more than a neighborhood. It's more than a village. I like to think of it as kind of like three R's. It's a group of people who have respect, who have responsibility. The minister spoke about that today. We've got to get a lot more of that in the 21st century. And it's about resilience. And you can have those in digital communities. You can have those in virtual communities. You can have those in big communities like mine in Toronto, or you have it here in Hawaii. But we can't lose sight of that very human foundation of communities, which is so important to us as a business and to, uh, to us as a country. Um, Don, you mentioned uh, pickup hockey with Vladimir Putin. I'll just tell you one story. When you get to play uh, a, a late night game in Moscow with uh, uh, President Putin, who was Prime Minister at the time, and it was a three on three game. I won't uh, uh, give you all the details on how we ended up there. But at the opening face off, it was me against him. They dropped the puck. I'm a terrible hockey player, by the way. But I, I, I whacked it through his stick. And I'll never forget these blue eyes piercing <laughs> through the cage of the. He won every face-off after that. <laughs> why, this, why I'm here today. So that's resilient to me. Uh, always let the dictator win the face-off. <laughs> why no resilience. Uh, the minister uh, also mentioned Bill Davis, who we're so fortunate to have in our province. And, and I've been lucky to know uh, Mr. Davis on and off for, for many decades, uh, and really going back to the 19. 60s when I was a, a kid growing up in Scarborough, my father was an Anglican minister and got a, he was a community leader in Scarborough and got a call one day from the education minister, Mr. Davis, saying we, uh, we need a community college in, uh, in East Toronto. And this was in May. And my father said, sure, we'll pull some people together and try to, uh, try to make, that, uh, make that happen. So I don't, by the way, first class has got to be in October, in four months. And you know what they did at Centennial College opened its door four months, uh, four months later. And I share that because I think we've lost a bit of that gumption in our communities today, that willingness to say, let's get stuff done. And I feel that here in Blythe, I see that in Blythe, I see it in all sorts of parts of Ontario. And if we can liberate that, uh, that gumption, that human spirit, the resilience, but also the responsibility that goes uh, with that, our communities are gonna do stuff that uh, our, our businesses and governments are gonna be proud to, to follow, but let's let our uh, communities Let's let our uh, communities lead. Got a uh, presentation here. I've lost my clicker already. Here it is. Um, make sure I'll press the right button to get this going and not blow anything up. I'm totally stupid. It's uh, <laughs> totally straightforward. There we are. All right. Humans wanted. Um, humans wanted. I hope you all have a, a copy of the report. And if, uh, if, if you want to look at it digitally, just Google RBC and Humans Wanted. You might end up on our HR site, but uh, just look for the report as well and, uh, and uh, have a gander of it. It's got lots of really interesting uh, data in there, but some great stories as well. Great stories about Canadians doing. Wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, and we took this on because we sense there's a crisis in our country. It's a quiet crisis. You know, people aren't uh, rioting in the streets over this. 
but it, but it is a crisis. Uh, we hear this from our clients right across the country. They can't find enough people. Uh, this isn't just in uh, big cities like in this picture here. Uh, I've, I've got the, the, the best job in the country in many ways. I get to, to crisscross Canada, meet Canadians, and hear what they're up to. Uh, I was in Yellowknife recently, before that in Halifax. Same story. People without jobs, jobs without people. And we've got this opportunity to get something right and really shape the 2020s uh, for us. But 40% of employers out there feel they're not finding the right people. Why is that? That's crazy. We've got wonderfully talented people in this uh, country. So that's a, a, a solvable problem. But we're seeing this here also. I really wanted to speak uh, to, the, to this uh, forum today, but, but, but learn from you, because we're seeing this in the ag sector. Number one sector for uh, job vacancies in the country, 7% in the agriculture sector. You all know that. Who am I to tell you that? But it's something that Canadians don't appreciate. We have this extraordinary ag sector uh, as well as other sectors in rural Canada that are lacking uh, people and the skills that they need to thrive in the, uh, in the 2020s. The cost is extraordinary as well. Something like a billion and a half dollars of sales are lost every year in Canada's ag sector because we don't have the right people. They're the people with the right skills to be doing things. And it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse in a hurry because we've got lots of baby boomers, some of you in the room, who are going to be retiring over the next decade. By 2025, half of the job vacancies in rural Canada are going to be here in Ontario, 47,000 vacant positions if we don't start to do things in a, in a different way. So this is the crisis that is, uh, that is shaping up for us. At the same time, and this is where it gets really exciting in my mind, there's extraordinary things going on with technology in agriculture. We talk about Silicon Valley. If you want to see Silicon Valley, just drive down the road here. You'll see some extraordinary digital things going on. Or go down to Guelph or Waterloo and see what the schools there are doing with that. You're seeing robotics. You're seeing AI. You're seeing all sorts of technologies that could send people to the moon if we wanted to. But they're making our farms smarter. They're making our, foods, our, our food safer. They're making our exports more sustainable. So we've got technology in spades all over our farms. But we need the people with the skills to really harness that technology in the, uh, in the decades ahead. And that to us is what humans wanted, is really, really bad. If we can get this right, and by the way, the number one sector for productivity growth over the last decade in this country is agriculture. Agriculture <coughs> is running circles around all sorts of other sectors in this country. Partly because other sectors have been held back by certain policies, which we hope are going to be corrected. Uh, but we've got a lot of catching up to do with the rest of the world in terms of productivity. We've got the technology, we've got the people, but we've got to harness them and put them together better. The payoff for Canada is going to be extraordinary. If we can get, for young people in the audience, if we can help you get your productivity level up to the G7 average, we're not talking about matching Germany at the front of the back. We just need to get up to the G7 average in productivity. The payoff for Canada is $40 billion. So when we look at how we're going to pay for our health care and our education and our pensions of the future, this has got to be part of that. This is the most powerful variable in our mind. If we can just help you achieve the productivity that we know you can do in your sleep probably with that technology. But we've got to get out of your way but support you. And that would be the payoff for, uh, for Canada in the decades ahead. So as Don mentioned, we, uh, we started something called Future Launch uh, last year. RBC gives away 1% of, uh, of our profits every year to uh, Canadian charities and philanthropies. And we made a commitment that over the next decade, and half of that, so $500 million, will go to help the future, sort of will go to help Canadian youth prepare for a world of work that we know is going to be fundamentally different. And if we don't get this right, there's going to be problems to pay for Canada in the 2020s and 2030s. If we do get it right, we think this country can do things that no other country in the world can do, and we think we've got to do this to help, uh, to help lead the world. So this is our investment in you, to helping ensure you can lead us in the 2020s and 2030s. But you need skills, you need networks, you need mentorship, you need lots of other things, and tell us what you need, and we'll try to uh, pull the people together to help you make that happen in whatever community you're, uh, you're in. But we're behind you as we see this enormous energy and, uh, and, and opportunity. And as part of this uh, program, we wanted to better understand 
how the future of work was changing. We know this. We see this in every workplace in the country. Different skills changing really by the uh, by the day. But we wanted to have a much deeper understanding of it. So we put together a study team of uh, data scientists and economists at RBC. We uh, we assembled a database of two million job postings across Canada, across 300 occupations. We developed our own algorithms. And we went through them to see what skills are more in demand, what skills are less in demand, and what skills are common across different uh, jobs, especially the ones that are, uh, that are growing. So we wanted to share this with, uh, with anyone who would listen, but especially with young people who are having to make uh, critical ed education and career choices. So I'll share with you a few of the things that uh, we've, we've, we've found. Well, then we also crisscrossed the country, talked to groups of young people, with educators, with employers, uh, with parents, about what they're seeing to bring some qualitative insights into uh, uh, into into the study. So I'll share five quick uh, findings with you, and you can get lots more detail in the report. Number one, you know what? The robots are not coming for your jobs. There's going to be more jobs, not less. So all this hysteria that you see in the media that robots are going to destroy every job, it ain't happening. And if you go back through history and you look at technological revolution, so over the last 300 years. Everyone leads to more jobs, not less. Eliminates jobs, don't want, to, uh, don't want to minimize that, especially for people who are losing their jobs, that happens. But in aggregate, in total, we're gonna to come out of this with more jobs, not less. And we gotta ensure that they're good jobs, and that our people, our children, are prepared for those, uh, for those good jobs. We think over the next five years, two and a half million new jobs are gonna be created across this country. We don't have enough people for these. But we've got to make sure these are great jobs and that we've got the people with the skills to, uh, to take advantage of these jobs and keep them here in uh, Canada. Number two, pretty much every job out there, most jobs out there, is going to go through a fundamental disruption of the skills required for those, uh, for those jobs. So the jobs are going to stay. But for those of you who are employed, Ten years from now, the skills that are going to be required for those jobs, it can be a farmer, it can be a radiologist, it can be a checkout clerk at the store, the skills are going to be very, very different. So we've got to think about how do we prepare the skills or prepare ourselves for those future skills, but more importantly, how do we build foundations so that we can develop skills as, uh, as <coughs> the requirements for jobs uh, change significantly. Foundational skills are critical. You hear a lot about STEM. You hear a lot about coding. We need more coders in this country. We don't need a nation of coders. Not everyone in Canada in the 2020s and 2030s is going to need to be a full-time coder. In fact, that would probably be a bad thing for Canada. We need designers. We need communicators. We need salespeople. We need marketers. We need entrepreneurs who can work with those coders and create incredible things maybe understand the language of coding, not dismissing that. But we have to appreciate the, the, the diversity of skills that are required and will be required more tomorrow than today. And to make that happen, we need foundational skills. We need people who are strong in communications, in collaboration, in critical thinking, in complex problem solving. We've got to ensure that our education system develops these foundational skills. We have to define them better. And we have to measure them better. We as an employer struggle with this. How do we know what makes a critical thinker? How do we measure that when we hire someone and, and monitor their progress while they're uh, with us? Lots of great opportunities there that we can talk about when we get to uh, the discussion. But those foundational skills are really important. And then you can add other skills as you, uh, as you, uh, as you move along. I discovered a bit about that, spending some time with uh, Heller State Winery down in the Niagara region where they're going through phenomenal technology disruption. And they're adding people, lots of practical people. They're growing, they're taking on export markets. And they need new skills. But they've got to have a foundation. And then they train their people, or send their people to Niagara College in, uh, in the Niagara region to develop the skills uh, that are emerging. But they can't learn those new skills if they don't have those foundational skills. Number four, you may not all want to hear this. <laughs> You gotta be good with numbers. Doesn't mean you need to be a mathematician, but you have to have some fluency. We call it numeracy. It's like you gotta be able to read, you gotta be able to do a little more than count. Pretty much 
the majority of jobs we see out there require some degree of numeracy. Again, you don't need to be a mathematician, but you've got to understand the language of numbers because it's going to matter to all sorts of jobs that have nothing to do on the surface with mathematics, but numbers and computing are important to them. And you're just going to be way better at it if you uh, have that foundation in, uh, in math and in numbers. And last, cultural awareness. And this is particularly important for global awareness. The world is growing incredibly, and Canada is shrinking as a share of that world. We're 35 or so million people in a world of 7 billion. And our future, and certainly to, to uh, the students in the audience, your future is going to be shaped by that world. Complex, messy, sometimes not a great reflection of humanity. But we as Canadians need to work with that world. We need to communicate and interact with that world like never before. And if you can develop the cultural fluency skills to be able to travel, to speak, to work with people from different parts of the world, your future is going to be limitless and you're going to take Canada with you. But we're seeing this in uh, job requirements across the, uh, across the country. Just give you a little example of an employer I got to meet in Regina, Saskatchewan. He runs a company called Neuro Developments. They make water purification systems. He uh, sells these all over the world in places like Haiti and Cambodia. Hires every engineer he can get out of the University of Regina. His only problem is the kids coming out of the University of Regina don't have a lot of cultural awareness. They don't have a lot of global awareness. And he's got to get them on a plane to places like Haiti or the Dominican Republic almost from the moment they start. And he was so frustrated with this lack of cultural fluency of these um, whip smart engineering students coming out that he hired a full-time coach for them who works with them to develop their abilities and their skills to go into a business meeting in Cambodia and have a conversation with the translator, but to understand how to work the room, how to be sensitive or aware of what other people in the room might be thinking or asking for, and how to negotiate literally and figuratively with people from very different backgrounds that they might be familiar with in Regina. We see this across the, across, across the country. Great opportunity for Canada, but we've got to get a lot, uh, a lot better at it. Our biggest discovery, though, was about skills mobility. We're a nation that was built on geographic mobility. It's one of the things that made Canada great. We have people, our, our forebears, who crisscross the country, creating communities like this. The 21st century is going to be shaped by skills mobility. You may not need to leave. This is a wonderful uh, bit of news. You may not need to leave live to be able to do all sorts of different careers or different jobs in your career. Or you're going to need to adapt and change the skills that, uh, that, uh, that you have, maybe multiple times through, your, uh, uh, through the decades. The great news is this is actually easy, especially if you have those foundational skills. And we took our database, those 300 jobs that we, we studied, we were able to put them into six clusters. These are the names of the doers, crafters, technicians. You can see the details in the, uh, the report. I didn't realize that pretty much every job out there is made up of 30 to 35 skills. And within each of these clusters, you're within roughly five skills of any other job in the cluster. Now these aren't skills that you can learn overnight or on a weekend, but with enough planning with the partnership of a good school or education uh, provider online, you can develop those skills as you go through uh, life. And therefore, you've got all sorts of opportunities to move around within your cluster to all sorts of other jobs. As perhaps your job disappears or the demand for it uh, starts to decline, or you just get bored with it. You want to do something different. Wonderful opportunities by adding skills through your working life around to different positions. So I'll give you a couple of examples. If you go into an underground mine today, go up to northern Ontario, go into a uh, go underground, you're not going to find a lot of people working. You're going to find smart machines. You're going to find the robots there doing the work that uh, people did half a century ago. That's probably a good thing. That's, uh, that's pretty uh, rough work. Probability of automation, 93% for underground miner today. Good news is, they can shift with just a few different skills to being an electrician. Low probability of automation, high demand, 
great opportunities all over the world, frankly, but certainly all over Algeria. Same transferable foundational skills, easily transferable. <coughs> so how would we help the miners of today think about becoming electricians and plan for, uh, plan for that? We're in the service sector, retail buyers. Again, something that is going through intense automation. You can shift to becoming an event planner. High, high demand, low probability of automation with just a few different skills. Back to the underground miners. You can become a veterinary technician with, I think, it's just three different skills. Huge demand for vet technicians. So how do we help the, uh, people who are working in jobs like underground mining think about those other alternatives, like working as a, uh, uh, as a vet technician? <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a few things we can do. Not easy, but we actually know how to do them. And if we work together, that community spirit, we can get these things done and we can get, we can get them done very quickly. First of all, better labor market information. <coughs> for those of you who are looking around for labor market information, what kind of jobs are in demand, <coughs> you have my sympathies. It is so hard and it is so bloody frustrating this day an age of uh, universal information that we're not able to share good information with each other about what jobs are out there, what jobs are in demand, and what skills are required for those jobs. That's a solvable problem, but we gotta solve it. Yeah, we gotta solve it together. <coughs> so that you can make the right choices about what you're studying, what schools you're going to, what jobs you may want to uh, work towards. Excuse me. Secondly, lifelong learning. <coughs> this may sound like bad news. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> the moment you walk out of school, when you finish school, it's not the end of your education, it's the beginning. <coughs> we all have to see education as a lifelong journey. <coughs> not something you're done with when you're 18 or 21. That's actually wonderful. It's wonderful to be able to learn. But we have to get much better at it as a society. Got to be, 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 find ways to ensure that if you're a working mother at age 30, that you're able to learn and be, uh, develop credits for that, that'll help you prepare for the, uh, for the jobs of uh, tomorrow. We have to find new ways of financing that uh, and find new education providers in a more competitive environment to ensure that we're, uh, we're providing the skills <coughs> Excuse me, of tomorrow. Thirdly, we've got to hire for skills over credentials. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my body telling me to shut up. <laughs> if you look for a job, there's way too many employers who tell us or tell you, show us your credentials. Rather than asking, what are the foundational skills that you've got? Show to me that you are creative, that you're a critical thinker, that you can solve complex problems. And I, as an employer, can teach you lots of the technical skills that you see in credentials. So we've got to shift our, our, our approach as employers. <coughs> and then lastly, and this is the point I really want to stress today, is work integrated learning. Co-ops, internships, apprenticeships, which we think is Canada's great, great opportunity and one that Ontario certainly can lead. We're pretty good at it. At it as a country. In fact, we created, in some ways, the co-op education system is down the road here at Waterloo, and we've expanded it significantly across Ontario. We hear from students that they want this. Every co-op and internship uh, program in the province has a wait list to get into it. Those that don't, do, don't have a wait list. So students are, tell, are sending that signal to us. Educators know that this transforms <coughs> Excuse me. The classroom. When students are coming back into the classroom from, uh, from a uh, from an internship or a co-op placement, it changes the dynamic of the classroom. <coughs> They're bringing knowledge and insight back in that, that makes it more dynamic. And critically for us as employers, it changes the way we work. <coughs> Excuse me. When we have uh, students. Coming in, they, they not only bring new knowledge with them, they challenge us. And I'll get to some examples in, uh, in a minute. My voice. 
<coughs> Excuse me, it allows me to. I'll just throw, share three examples here. Wow. <laughs> It's Friday, so, uh, yeah, as much as I love RBC Mints, I'm going to do with Fisherman's Friday. It's uh, Fisherman Friday Friday as well. It's uh, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so when people talk about communities in action, you just saw it. That's great, thank you. Um, so three quick examples on work integrated learning at work. We have a program at RBC called Amplify. We take in 2,000, <coughs> excuse me, 2,500 students a year through <coughs> to our co-op program. And we don't see them as worker bees. We see them as transformation agents for, for us. And increasingly, we're taking more and more of them every year, <coughs> excuse me, and putting them on teams to solve our biggest problems. Because the banking industry is going through profound change. We, most of our business is now done online, especially on phones. <coughs> and we're needing to uh, change every day the way we uh, work. And we're turning to our co-op students to help us see things that we may not see on, on our own. Last uh, summer, we took uh, 100 students, uh, a little over 100, put them onto teams. Our CEO gave them his biggest challenges to go away for the summer and solve them. <coughs> Many of them had never worked in banking before. Students from very different backgrounds, engineers, art students, designers, a couple of music majors. They came back, we had a pitch competition at the end of the summer. Under that program, we have filed 15 patents. This is changing our business. We like to think of this as a secret ingredient, but we don't want it to be a secret, because we want employers across the country, private and public sector, to see the power of youth working for you. Shopify, amazing company in Ottawa. Uh, e-commerce platform, can't get enough coders. They have created a, a fascinating program with Carleton. They've expanded it to York. Excuse me, this is, uh, this is embarrassing. Whereas if you go work for uh, Shopify, this program now, <coughs> on day one, you go to Carleton or York in the morning, in the afternoon, you go to Shopify to work. And over four years, you do something like 4,500 hours with Shopify. You're paid very well. You get your degree, you get a computer from Shopify. The whole package is worth about $250,000 from a student's point of view. Shopify clearly has great students coming out of the program. But it's also changing Shopify's, uh, Shopify's business. They want to do this more and more because it helps them grow. It's not just a bit. <coughs> Finding talent, it's about working differently. But think about it from the school. Carleton is now one of the country's top computer science schools because of this program. Because you can imagine teaching computer science. And on day two, all of your class have just come from Shopify. They know stuff you don't know as a teacher. <laughs> so you're going to flip your classroom. You're going to say, teach me. Tell me what you've learned. I'll challenge you. I'll, I'll ask you questions. But it's a much more co uh, cooperative approach to education. It's making Carleton way better. It's making Shopify way better. It's making these students exceptional. And here's one wonderful surprise for the program. Every computer science program in the country is trying to find out how to attract more females, more girls, into their programs. If they can get to 20%, that's considered a success. The Carlton program, year one, 50%. These girls have to be practical. If they see what this program is doing, they want to be part of it. Peller Estates, as I mentioned, I've got to spend some time, time with them. 
<coughs> over the last uh, year. I've seen the way they're transforming their business with youth coming out of Brock University and the co-op program there. <coughs> Heller has to compete with wineries of Europe and the United States and New Zealand and Chile. They don't have the resources for a big R&D department. Brock University is their R&D department. But it's not just uh, professors sitting in a lab, it's students coming out of those labs and, and then having work terms at Heller Estates. <coughs> Working with drone technology, working with earth sensor technology to transform the way wine is uh, made. And Peller Estates has now become sort of, sort of a co continental leader because of what they're doing with, uh, with Brock. So how do we do more of this? And I'll wrap up with this. We formed something called the Business Higher Education Roundtable because we see this as mission critical to us as an organization. We see it as mission critical for our clients and we want them to the fraud. And we see it as a fantastic opportunity for the youth of Canada. And we'd like governments to, uh, to come along on the journey, but we're not going to wait. So we've sat down with uh, universities and community, community colleges and polytechnics to form this roundtable. So how do we do more of this? So we've launched pilot projects in the financial services sector out of Toronto. We've committed to 10,000 new internships <coughs> excuse me, over the next three years. Working with 20 or so schools in the, uh, in the greater uh, Toronto and Hamilton uh, area. We've done other pilot projects with the aerospace industry in, uh, in Montreal, with the construction industry in uh, Western Canada, with entrepreneurs in Atlantic Canada. Happy to work with, uh, with people in this region, with employers anywhere and educators anywhere who want to experiment and test these ideas of work integrated learning as a way of transforming your business, as a way of transforming learning opportunities for, uh, for today and tomorrow's youth. We've also reached out to governments to be part of this, to push, because they're the main, main funders of educators, to push them to be as innovative as we uh, need them to be, to help us develop a made in Canada technology platform so that youth across the country can see opportunities for work placements anywhere in the country in any sector and we can use smart computing techniques to help you see opportunities that you may not or your guidance counselor may not uh, see on, uh, on, on first glance. <coughs> so just in wrapping up, just catch my, uh, my, my breath here, I hope we can have a good uh, conversation about this. With, uh, <coughs> with the panel, I apologize for all this, uh, all, all this coffee during, during the talk. Just in wrapping up, I hope we can reflect on the opportunity for communities to be at the core of this, be at the foundation of what we're trying to do in the 2020s with this incredible digital revolution that is changing every industry, every sector, <coughs> every workplace, not as a threat, but as an opportunity, because the jobs that most of you are gonna fill 10 years, 20 years from now, are gonna be better than the jobs we have today. If we can help you develop the skills, the full range of skills to take advantage of, uh, take advantage of those. I'd like to think that uh, economic prosperity really depends on three T's. It's talent, trade, and technology. We're starting to get our trade act together a little better today than six months ago. Canada's in a very fortunate position where we have trading opportunities and relationships with most of the world. <coughs> most of the world wants to do business with us. We have to get better at it. We have to take advantage of these opportunities in ways that we, uh, that we haven't in years past. But that's how, we, that's how we create prosperity. But trade alone, Trade doesn't happen on its own. You need the technology and talent. Technology doesn't grow on trees. It requires investment. It requires entrepreneurs to take resources and invest in that. And we're trying to find ways to help the great entrepreneurs of, of, of Ontario do a lot more of that, to take advantage of this extraordinary historic moment when technology is changing everything. But technology on its own can't do anything. You need the talent. 
need that, those humans, which is why we call our report Humans Wanted, to really drive the technology. This is the opportunity for Canada. It's the opportunity for you in this room. You've got a chance here. A hundred years ago, I was looking at the, uh, the memorials on this wall. The most awful war in history ended. Just a few weeks from now, we'll be marking the 100th anniversary of that. Millions of people, young men and women, came home to uh, the US and Canada. <clears throat> and there was a technology revolution going on at that time as well. And it transformed the way the 21st century was. And we were able to create colleges and universities and a vibrant school system to help develop the talent of Ontario, which really fostered the prosperity that drove this province through the 20th century. We don't need a war to push us to do that today. But we have this opportunity to take that technology, to take an opportunity of trade with the world, and to take the talent of the people in this room and create opportunities that we couldn't have imagined just a few years ago to develop the prosperity of communities across the country. Thank you for enduring my uh, hacking here, for inviting me to this wonderful community here, and for sharing this, uh, this day with us. Looking forward to a great uh, conversation. Thank you.